Um, good morning and thank uh, everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm Ricardo Arias. I'm president of the Greater Houston Coffee Association. I'm also uh, a trade development manager at Port Houston. Uh, just a quick introduction of the Coffee Association for those of you who are not familiar with the Greater Houston Coffee Association. We are uh, the organization that promotes and protects the Houston area coffee supply chain. Houston is one of five coffee exchange ports in the US uh, that is a delivery point for uh, green Arabica coffee. There is also a Harris County uh, tax exemption that keeps the cost of green coffee imports competitive. The Coffee Association works on these initiatives to keep the coffee industry in Houston. Today, we're pleased to host Alejandro Molina as our speaker for part two of a seven part webinar series detailing the coffee supply chain from farm to cup. Thank you to our webinar sponsor, Port Houston. If you would like to become a sponsor, please reach out to us. Um, and just a few housekeeping notes before we uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, number one, our webinar is being recorded and it, it will be posted on our website. Uh, number two, everyone is uh, joined in listen only mode. If you're on the computer or smart, smartphone app, uh, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature, which is uh, usually found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to get some questions um, uh, after we hear from our speaker. Uh, if you see that somebody already asked a question that you like, uh, please upvote it, uh, and that will that will help us prioritize the questions we ask. All right, now I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Alejandro Molina. He's the general manager of San Victor Coffee, a specialty coffee exporter out of Guatemala. Alejandro has been in the food and beverage industry since uh, 2013 and the coffee industry since 2014. Previously, he was a trader at Newman Coffee Group and director of sustainability and market access at Anacafe, the National Coffee Association of Guatemala. He graduated from Texas A&M with a bachelor's in agricultural economics, and he spent his early years uh, of his career in Houston. And that's when I had the pleasure of, of meeting him. Welcome, Alejandro. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, you guys for having me. Thanks, Ricardo. Thank you to the Port of Houston. Thank you to Christine Schenker at the Greater Houston Port Bureau. And obviously, um, thank you to the Greater Houston Coffee Association. It's really a pleasure to be able to um, make the the way around as now I'm living in Guatemala, um, but I was a fellow Houstonian for several years, graduated as you guys mentioned from Texas A&M. So it's a pleasure to be able, be able to present um, this presentation to you guys. So you know, we're gonna get started. Just wanna verify we're good to, can see our screen, Ricardo? I can see it. All right. So as Ricardo uh, mentioned, um, right now I'm living in Guatemala. I work for a company called San Victor Coffee. We are a specialty coffee exporter, relatively small, medium-sized uh, operation. And we encompass everything from a the coffee farm to um, exporting. We have a coffee mill as well, uh, which we will go over in the presentation. This is a wet mill versus a dry mill. We'll make the distinctions today. And our dry milling is outsourced, um, but we will go through kind of the different processes of the supply chain. Um, we're a specialty micro mill, um, in the coffee industry, there's obviously a lot of different sized operations. Guatemala produces roughly about 3 million 
bags of exportable coffee a year. Uh, this is in comparison to Brazil, which produces about 60 million bags, and Colombia, which is usually around 12 to 14 million bags. So in comparison, just to give everybody a idea of where Guatemala stands, we're, we're small in the big scheme of the coffee world, and we're more of a, a niche uh, producers. We, we do have good amount of volume, but mostly um, producing quality coffees. Uh, most of our coffees are traditionally washed process, which we will go over today in the presentation. And, um, and this differs from the natural process coffee, which is prevalent in Brazil and other countries. Our job at, at San Victor is we connect uh, specialty coffee producers to buyers. We try to engage the supply chain. That way, um, producers can have more direct ask, access to their markets. Buyers can have more traceability to their coffee. This is a trend that we've seen across the coffee industry over the years with new terms like direct trade coming about. Um, and this is something that to look out for in the future uh, due to you know, logistics and financing. Um, it's still one of the biggest obstacles in the supply chain, but uh, now with technology, with uh, faster logistics and everything being digitalized, um, the producers are being able to connect, to connect every day more uh, to the buyers. And I think uh, it's prevalent today with the presentation that I'm here in Guatemala and we're, we're able to have this, this conversation. So starting at the first stage of the coffee uh, stage from, from farm to container, um, the first stage of any farm or any coffee is the nursery stage, which is the planning. I think here the, the key thing to distinguish is that coffee is an investment for anybody, for producers. Uh, you don't just wake up on a coffee farm. Uh, you have to, first of all, you know, purchase the land if you don't have land and you have to purchase uh, the coffee seeds and uh, the, the seedlings to be able to develop your nursery and plant. This process can take up to three years depending on the varietal and those three years are pure investment where you're not gaining any returns on on um, on your business pretty much so I think that's something that's um, sometimes not highlighted or uh, communicated well but coffee is an investment uh, obviously this this has many implications financially uh, to where we're not seeing returns as farmers for three years um, and that's uh, the first uh, productions of the, those plants. They're not the, obviously the optimal productions. So as farmers, uh, we have to be very technical um, in how we're planning our, not just the agricultural part, but our financial planning for our farms and our investments, how we're going about um, getting the money to invest in our farms and our operations. So this is a super important part of the supply chain, uh, the coffee planting or nursery stage. You can see here I'm pictured with um, some plants. Uh, there it's labeled, you can kind of see it. It's called maracatura. Uh, that, that's more of a specialty coffee varietal. But this nursery stage is where the coffee gets developed. And then in about in a year and a year and a half, depending on the agronomist's point of view, it will be taken to uh, the field to be planted. Um, today, the, the presentation, just to give a heads up, is gonna be highly visual because normally this is something that you could come down to origin, as we call it, to come visit, to come see, um, to come see the process because it's super, it's hard for, for someone that's never been at a farm to really get an idea of, um, what, what it's actually like, the plants, the touch, the feel of, of a coffee cherry, of a coffee seed. So that's why we're gonna to try to make it super visual for you guys today to be able to 
get an idea of, of what it's like. Um, this is a, a coffee, pretty much a embryo or in its development stage in Brazil. Um, this process is, or they call it the chumbinho, and it's a super important stage actually in the coffee production. Um, you'll hear traders or, or different people in the market when, um, when the, this stage is happening, they're very sensitive to, to what's going on with the rain um, because this is the kind of the essential growth stage as I labeled it here of the coffee plant. So during this stage, we're looking for a lot of rain as agronomist um, to be able to develop the, the proper growth and maturing of the coffee cherry. Um, obviously this has huge impacts on the coffee market if it doesn't rain during this stage. So traders and, and like um, are always very um, on the nose about this, trying to keep up with what's going on uh, weather-wise while the chumbinho or development stage is happening of the coffee. And obviously this is, you know, the, um, the coffee leaves, the cherry at this point is, uh, is green. And as you will see in the following pictures, it'll be maturing and changing colors. At the top, you can kind of see on the, on the top of the cherry, you can see a little um, circle. That's kind of the, the embryo from where the, the coffee comes out from the nursery stage. This is um, a full grown coffee plant, obviously. Uh, the maturation or the different color of the, of the cherry is going from roughly green to like a yellowish red to a full uh, cherry red. And then in specialty coffee or kind of high end, higher end uh, specialty coffee, we're looking for a maroon color, which um, optimizes the sweetness of, of the coffee profile and is the best as far as um, cup wise, as far as the, the taste of the coffee. Um, in the background, you can kind of see a word that says Recepa 2013. Recepa uh, means pruning. And just like wine or different um, cultivars, uh, for coffee, pruning is essential. It's something that perhaps in um, maybe more old school terms of, of farming, wasn't done very much, but um, there's very new techniques of pruning and pruning pretty much allows um, the coffee to leaves and produce pretty much double what it produced before. So in, um, as far as coffee farming, not just in production wise, but financially, we're always looking to optimize our pruning techniques. We don't want, even if a coffee plant produces, let's say 50 pounds, um, if we spent a certain amount of money to produce those 50 pounds, it's not optimal. We rather spend zero that year and then the next year produce a hundred. So um, the agriculture is becoming very technified, uh, very technical, sorry. And, um, and really trying to optimize every single plant. Uh, people know by their sector, by their area, by their hectares, they know how many plants they have, how much they should be producing, how much they're investing. And the pruning is something that's super vital to coffee producers uh, in, order, in order for them to be uh, sustainable. Um, also, uh, we worked here in Guatemala with companies uh, such as Volcafe, um, they're a, a multinational um, um, trading house, and um, they have a methodology called Volcafe Way, in which they really try to um, impart this sustainability to producers. Because one of the biggest things that challenges that producers face is obviously the economic sustainability of production, and we have what's called in the coffee industry biannuality, where one year we produce a good harvest and the next year we produce less of a harvest. So by having a good pruning schedule and having a, your plants and plantations and a good maintenance schedule, you kind of avoid these peaks, ebbs and flows of production, which obviously make it hard for you to have reliable customers, have a steady incomes, 
So this is one of the most important things that you can do as a coffee farmer in order to have a economic sustainability in your operation. Um, after the production stage, we have obviously the, the coffee wet mill. Um, the wet mill is pretty much a sorting and depulping, as we call it, of the coffee cherries. Uh, these cherries, um, as I'm going to show in the next picture, they have the two seeds of coffee inside. I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead just to show you a bit. Here is the coffee cherry. So we have like the outside skin or what we call the pulp of the cherry. And then inside we have the two uh, seeds, which make up what, what we know as a, as a coffee, coffee seed. So going back a bit in this process of the wet mill, um, you know, there's different, now there's much more mechanical systems. The one pictured is a Colombian traditional uh, depulpers. And what's going on here is um, the first stage is a siphoning stage where pretty much the, the cherries are floated to see um, sometimes there's cherries that were, they didn't mature fully. So they will obviously float to the top of, um, of that water siphon. And then there's other cherries that have the full weight. They have the good two seeds. So those proceed to the 4D pulpers. You can see um, kind of to the right there at the bottom. Those are the four traditional uh, horizontal depulpers. So um, pretty much they have a, they remove that, that skin and you will have the two um, seeds, which we showed in the different stage. At the beginning of the presentation, you saw um, a picture of some fermentation tanks. So what precedes this stage of the coffee wet mill is what we call fermentation in the coffee industry. There's a lot of different um, opinions about if it's really a fermentation or not, uh, technically speaking. But what we're doing here is we are removing the mucilage, which is kind of this kind of sticky part that you can see that's stuck to the coffee. Um, we're removing that through a physical process at um, normally about 12 to 18 hours of fermentation. And this is a traditional wash process, as I explained at the beginning. Um, now they're uh, just like the craft brewery scene in Houston or different places. Um, coffee producers as well are, are being super innovative. Ourselves at the mill, we're doing different things with fermentations. Um, we're using different yeast in the fermentation process. Um, we're doing anaerobics, which is we're removing the presence of, of, of air or in the process, um, trying to extend those fermentation times, trying to develop distinct flavors inside of, of the coffee a seed. So it's super interesting, everything that's going on now in the seed, now in the coffee industry. Uh, I didn't get too much into detail to, to confuse any folk, but um, there's different processes as well. The natural process is where we uh, keep this cherry uh, in the full form and we just take it out to the drying patios. We don't remove the, the skin or anything. We don't do that fermentation part. We just take it out to the, to the patios and let it dry in its full natural form. That's called a, a full natural. And then there's um, variations on that um, to where we don't ferment, we leave some of the mucilage on the, on the coffee seed and those are called a honey process. So there's different variations that are occurring right now in the coffee industry, um, mostly in the specialty realm. What's interesting is these techniques or uh, processes as, as we call them, they've been around for, for hundreds of years um, in different countries in, in, um, in East Africa, in Indonesia, um, due to the weather patterns, uh, these countries have had to adapt how they do their processing. So it's super interesting how um, now coffee producers, since we're kind of interconnected in this uh, new digital world, um, we're trying processes that maybe were more prevalent in countries like Kenya or Indonesia, we're trying them in Guatemala. Uh, very similar to, to what happened with wine as well, with the cultivation of wine from you know France to California or, or things like that. 
And this is a um, after the fermentation stage. So after this 12 to about 18 hours of fermentation, where we remove the mucilage from the coffee seed, um, we take the, um, we wash the coffee. Um, this is kind of changing. There's, there's long channels um, where the coffee is, is moved maybe about 20 or 30 meters of, of, of water um, to where the coffee is washed, we call it. So we're pretty much remo removing whatever was left of that mucilage during this kind of wash process. And then in Central America, um, in these channels, they, they do a further classification um, using the, the simple techniques of, of obviously the, the coffee cherries that weigh less will float to the top of these channels and they'll be discarded in the process, producing a more, um, obviously a very high quality, uh, we call it a first quality or primeras in the coffee uh, wet milk. So um, this is being modified a lot because there's high water usage in this stage, obviously it can be very costly as well. So there's now a lot of mechanization in the process. Um, here in the coffee drying uh, parchment stage, um, the coffee, the coffee um, will undergo a time for about 12 to 14 days. This is sun dried or as they call it patio dried. So at 100% um, exposure to the sun and the coffee, as you can kind of see a person in, in the middle of our drying patios, they're moving uh, the coffee about you know three to five times a day, making sure that it's obviously being dried equally, equally distributed. And um, this will vary obviously depending on, on how much sun there is and uh, the time. There's a lot of, um, as far as moisture content, uh, when we export coffee, our goal or the parameters that most importers or roasters or, or our buyers have is they want the coffee to be at a 10 to 12% uh, moisture level in order to export the coffee. So when we begin this process, we're about a 55%. And then we basically reduce that to about 10 to 12%. Now, um, obviously this can be very labor intensive. This process requires a lot of people to be moving the coffee. And um, there's a lot of mechanization that's been occurring. Um, I don't have any photos pictured here, but uh, they utilize uh, guardiolas, which are kind of a cylindrical, uh, you know, rotating dryer in which the coffee enters and obviously is dried to that moisture level and in a much lesser uh, period of time. Um, there ex exists some paradigms between which drying method is better or not. The important thing is to follow the same principles. Don't expose the coffee to too much sun, too much heat. Um, the embryo is actually important in this stage because if you dry the coffee too, um, to too much heat or it gets exposed to too much heat, um, the embryo can, can, um, can destroy and that will actually cause the coffee to age a lot quicker. So this is important as an exporter because when we send the coffee to our clients, uh, it's not like that's where, you know, we sent the coffee, we got paid and, and the job's over. Uh, we want our clients to be happy. Uh, the importers obviously have to store the coffee sometimes for a long period of times or roasters as well. So it's very important actually that this drying stage be very calculated. Um, obviously a slow but also efficient process to where the coffee can dry to its optimal stage. Um, here is a little close-up of the coffee parchment. Um, here we have defects since the coffee hasn't been taken obviously to the final stage, which is the um, exporting uh, stage or the dry mill. So here you can see kind of a close-up of the coffee uh, parchment. It's got some, you know, kind of a yellowish uh, color. It's got some cherry seeds. So this is kind of what it looks like and it's kind of raw um, stage before it's sent out uh, to the exporter, where obviously a lot of these defects and, and things will be sorted out.
um, after the coffee is dried to its optimal 10 to 12% uh, moisture level in the parchment stage, we uh, store the coffee at our mill, which is a wet mill. And um, the storage is important because there occurs a certain period of time, roughly around three to five weeks, which we call a resting period. Um, it's kind of a funny example, but you know, if you go out and get a tan in the sun, uh, when you come inside the, the house into the AC, you kind of need some time to, to cool off a little bit. And it kind of, it's what happens with the coffee. Uh, it's been exposed to sun for 12 to 14 days. You know, it can be a little intense. So when it enters a warehouse, um, it's like a harmonization process to where the, the moisture is being equally distributed within all the coffee uh, seeds and it's kind of a uh, settling. Um, now there's uh, different measures which we call water activity. And um, this water activity measures kind of the fluidity of the water inside of the seeds because humidity, uh, I really liked the, the way it was explained to me one time, humidity is like taking a photo. It's okay, what's the humidity of the coffee right now? But water activity is like a video. It's like explaining the different um, stages of how that water has been distributed inside of that coffee seed. So that's something that um, producers are utilizing a lot. Uh, we also utilize it as well at, at our wet mill and there's different parameters of acceptable water activity levels, but it's something that uh, producers are keeping um, very close to mind and exporters. Um, especially, as I mentioned, the importance of coffee storage during this stage. Um, also, I think it's very vital to note that um, I think all producers would like to have air conditioned warehouses, but because we're kind of in the bottom part of the supply chain, there really isn't the amount of capital um, to be able to have high end warehouses. So we have to be very uh, smart in how we're storage, storing the coffee, making sure that it, it doesn't stay at our farm or facilities for too long. Um, in Guatemala, we have the, the blessing that uh, it doesn't rain during this stage. So we don't usually have problems with humidity, but either way we monitor the humidity levels at the warehouse and try to get it to the exporter um, in the soonest, uh, time possible. And um, the next stage, uh, the coffee is in, obviously in parchment. And after the parchment stage, the wet mill stage, we move the coffee to the dry mill. In our own personal operation, we don't have uh, a dry mill, so I didn't have the best photos to, to show you guys. But um, the basic concept here is we're removing the the parchment, which is kind of that outer skin layer um, from the seed, and we're left with the green coffee. So that's the most essential part, which we call hulling. So we're moving, kind of removing that, that, that skin, that parchment um, outer layer of those seeds, and we're left with the two seeds, which uh, maybe most people have seen, which is our green coffee. So those two seeds are our green coffee, which is what we roast, which is what later we grind and we brew to drink. So in the dry mill, uh, this is a further selection process um, of the coffee. Um, and there's different preparations according to uh, clients' needs, obviously, and, and what countries our clients are based on. Um, in the coffee industry, we've tried to standardize how these are evaluated because before, um, you know, Brazil would have a different uh, grading standard than Guatemala. Uh, for example, Brazil has a quality called New York Strictly Soft Fine Cup, um, New York 2-3, sorry, Strictly Soft Fine Cup. Then you'll have a Guatemala SHB Fancy. So these terms um, most traders know, but have have tried to been consolidated by the Specialty Coffee Association. As far as what constitutes a specialty coffee, um, according to the Specialty Coffee Association, it's a coffee which has zero primary defects and 
no more than five secondary defects. So um, I'm not gonna get in too much into detail into primary versus secondary, but primary could be like a rock or a foreign matter that's found in your coffee. These are not acceptable. So as exporters, we have to remove that from um, the process. Um, pictured is, a, is an Oliver table, which, which separates coffee by, by, by its size. Um, you have uh, the hulling, you have uh, de-stoners, the Oliver tables, which is pretty much like a gravity table. You have the screen sorters. So in coffee, we have uh, different screen sizes. And I don't know the exact, um, it's like 12, something of an, of an inch, but these different screens, basically they measure the different um, sizes of the, of the green coffee. So we have screen 17, screen 16, screen 15, screen 14. And then depending on your preparation, um, you will allow those screens to either pass or not pass. So if a client wants screen 15 and up, then obviously we will allow the, the coffee that's screen 15 and up in the, in the dry mill to go through and every, anything that's uh, smaller uh, bean wise will, will fall through and won't get um, packaged for export. So screen size, obviously I mentioned primary secondary defects, which will be uh, specified by the client. Um, normally, we, we have what's called a European preparation, which is the most common, which that will have about eight secondary defects. So it's a little bit more permissive. Uh, we've got the specialty preparation, like I mentioned, which is five secondary defects. And then we can have maybe for like a um, uh, cup of excellence, which is a competition of, of the best coffees in the, in the world, um, you know, maybe two to three secondary defects. So really depending here on the client, on you know, obviously what, what they're willing to pay for this preparation, but it's something custom, customized, customized that the clients can ask for from the exporters um, at the point of, of purchase. And then uh, following this whole, the coffee dry mill stage, there's, uh, we have electronic uh, sorters which are, are pretty amazing and, and they pretty much uh, do the job that that was missed by by any of the parts uh, previous and uh, pretty much through technology and and uh, color sorting they're able to identify at a super uh, high volume and speed the defects of the coffee um, this would be like a very technified uh, dry mill uh, they're still um, hand sorting in, in countries in you know in, even in Guatemala and in East Africa the during the export instead of having you know super expensive machines they still have a lot a huge line of a lot of um, staff which hand sorts uh, the defects that are not acceptable for the for the exportation this is the the best actual way still is 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 hand um, you know labor uh, because obviously the human human eye is the, the best thing that that we have, but it's obviously the the most costly as well. Um, and then finally, which you guys are probably a little bit more familiar on on your end, um, after the the coffee has been pre prepared at the coffee export uh, facility, it's loaded onto the shipping container. Uh, we usually line these containers, as you can see, with um, um, with a, a lining there. And th this this photo was provided by Cuatro M Coffees. They're an exporter in El Salvador. And um, there's different uh, you know markings that we put on the bags. Before before this stage, I kind of I skipped a little bit, um, but I didn't want to go too high into detail, but in the coffee industry, I think you guys are a little bit more familiar, but we obviously have cupping, which is a, a quality control um, aspect to the operation. Uh, cupping is, you know, um, just to, in case anybody doesn't know, it's a um, standardized way of trying the coffee in the same way along the entire supply chain. So I, as a farmer can try the same coffee as Ricardo uh, in Houston 
and we will roast the coffee to the same roasting level. We will utilize the same protocols um, in the tasting that way. Um, and that way it, um, we can analyze it in the same manner because obviously there's different coffee shops with different uh, methodologies for, for the roasting. Um, obviously we, a lot of coffee shops are more espresso based. Others are, you know, can have Chemexes and different things. So we, we try to utilize this cupping process through the supply chain that makes sure we're talking the same dialogue. So before the, the coffee gets uh, entered into the container, uh, I, I missed an important part, which is the pre-shipment sample. This is something that gets negotiated with, with the importer or the roaster um, to which once the coffee is prepared, there is a sample sent, usually about 350 grams to the importer, to the roaster of the exact quality that was processed. And this is kind of the final approval or the final um, yes from the buyer um, the buyer will cup this coffee, they will approve the contract. And once that is um, approved here at Origin, we seal that container. And that way, what they tried is exactly what's placed inside of the container. That's the way it should happen. Um, there's obviously variation sometimes, but the pre-shipment sample should be an exact representation of what we are exporting. This is different from an offer sample, which I can send at the beginning of the harvest, it's just an idea of what the coffee will taste like. But the pre-shipment sample is kind of the final green light uh, representative of the container. So it's very important that as clients, uh, you know, if there's any importers roasters that they cup this coffee well, they analyze the green coffee to make sure it's exactly what um, was negotiated. And then um, finally, um, I like to just um, give a little background. To, uh, we already went through the, the supply chain, but um, as producers, we're, we're pretty much price takers. We have low incentive to uh, maximize, you know, kind of our return of our, our investment. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to say on what prices we can sell the coffee. Exporters and importers, uh, because of the con consolidation of the industry, um, you need 275 bags to fill a container. So you need a lot of financing, you need logistics in order to get this container uh, to its destination. So the exporter and the importer are both able to hedge with the coffee market. They're able to protect their purchase and their sale to offset the risk. And they're obviously, um, you know, I think a, a misnomer is that, you know, the, the middlemen are making you know, all this money and it really is not like that. It's more of, uh, there's a lot of volume that, that goes through exporters and importers. And because of this volume, they're able to have sometimes more stable operations. And obviously at the end, we have the roaster, which is also able to fix their price uh, when the price, when the coffee market is low and able to mitigate their risk a bit. But as producers, we're, uh, we're a lot of the times we're price takers. Um, yeah, that just, to maybe just recap, uh, that's an important stat that I didn't put in writing, but you know, one container fits 275 bags of 69 kilograms. Um, they usually have jute bags. Um, now very popular are hermetic linings or what we call grain pro inside um, the bags, which also, um, keep the moisture content and keep the coffee alive for much larger uh, period of times. And also on the coffee, I didn't have any photos of this, but on the coffee bag, you will have the country code, which is the first number for Guatemala, it's 11. And then you'll following the country code, you'll have, uh, these are called the ICO marks. Um, and then following the country code, you'll have the exporter uh, code. In our case, it's 420. And then after the exporter code, you'll have the lot number, which is pretty much what uh, container or, or what exportation that was for the client or for the exporter that particular year. So um, if you have coffee from Guatemala, it should have uh, the number 11, should have your 
exporter code. So you can look that up to see who was the exporter. And then finally, it will have the specific lot number identified um, for that coffee. And um, finally, a stat that I like to share just to give an idea of the challenges for the coffee producers is the coffee market is valued of around $200 billion. And of that 200 billion, uh, the exporting countries receive less than 10% of that income. So 90% is retained in consuming countries and less than 10%, uh, less than 20 uh, billion is retained by all of the exporting uh, countries. And kind of give a, a better idea of this kind of disparity is that, you know, just in the US, we generate $27 billion off tax revenue generated directly from coffee. So we generate more from taxes in coffee than all of the exporters do in all of the exporting countries. Um, it, it's an important stat just to, to give a nature of the, um, of the challenges that exporters face and not just exporters, but it, it's a trickle down effect to the coffee producer, which obviously, you know, with low coffee market prices, it has very little incentive uh, to invest in their farm. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the operation, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, it's one of the most important parts of the operation. So um, just wanted to kind of end with that. It's important that you know we try to pay uh, fair prices to our coffee producers. Um, that way they can pay fair wages to everyone along the supply chain. So um, with that, um, that actually is the end of, of my presentation. Here are um, my contact details and um, I didn't want to extend too much. So to give everybody a time to ask uh, some questions. So thank you. Thank you Alejandro. Thank you, Alejandro. Very fascinating. Very fascinating. Uh, we do have a, a few questions. Um, if, if you're ready, uh, but before we do that, uh, just remind everybody that you can uh, ask the questions on, uh, on the uh, Q&A um, uh, part of the, of the app. So just make sure you, you send some questions uh, in right now while we have Alejandro on, on the line. But uh, Aaron Quinn is asking uh, what region of Guatemala you are in. Thank you for your question. I, I should have included it. I'm located in Frajanes, Guatemala, which is um, from Guatemala City. We're uh, southeast, about uh, 45 minutes from, from the city, obviously depending on traffic, but we're kind of opposite of Antigua, if you're, if you're familiar with Antigua. So we're kind of in the southeast region, kind of along the volcanic chain. Um, we have the Pacaya volcano, which is an active volcano. You can actually see it directly from our mill here and our farm. So we have the uh, Pacaya volcano, we have Lake Amatitlan. Um, so a lot of water, uh, really nice area. Okay, we have another really good question here is, how do you price your green coffee for export? How does the spot price in uh, New York affect that? Um, for us personally, um, we um, we are very um, thankful and also very fortunate uh, that we have what's called uh, fixed prices or outright prices. Um, a lot of our coffee, uh, most of our coffee gets sold uh, to Starbucks. So um, thankfully, um, Starbucks is able to provide a fixed price um, of the coffee, which is independent of what's going on in the um the New York Sea market. So um, not all producers have this, uh, this kind of thing at their favor, um, but we're very fortunate that we have kind of like an outright uh, price level for our coffee. And then obviously for higher end lots for uh, specialty coffee roasters, uh, we try to uh, be competitive and what's going on in the, in the industry and also um, and also try to kind of follow what's 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 normal. There's a interesting project called uh, Transparent Trade, which um, is a project that's headed by Emory University in Atlanta, 
and you guys can access this resource. They're generating data of kind of price qualities and prices that should be associated with those qualities. So I encourage you guys to, to check it out and I can maybe share that link with uh, Ricardo. Yeah, please do. So uh, we have a few more questions. I'm, I'm glad to, to see that. Uh, one is, uh, does San Victor Coffee have any uh, contracts directly with US uh, micro roasters? You mentioned Starbucks, but uh, do you have any micro roasters? Yeah. Um, yeah, we we do. Um, we work with um, Atlas uh, Atlas Coffee in in Austin, uh, Texas. They're they're one of our 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 top clients, and we're very grateful to Atlas Coffee Club to be working with them. They're a subscription service, so it's super interesting how this um, how the the way coffee is distributed is changing. I'm sure if you would have asked people five years ago if most of their sales were online they would have probably thought you were crazy you know because of coffee shops and, and drive throughs and and the sort so we work with them um we work with uh, tiny house coffee roasters in austin as well um we have uh several good friends in in the industry uh, java pura a roaster in in houston actually has bought some of our our coffee beans as well um so we're very thankful for for those partnerships Fantastic. And then we have a couple more questions. Um, uh, one, a quick one, are bugs an issue during shipping? Um, yes and no. I mean, if you're doing things the right way, it shouldn't be uh, any issue. Uh, the, the containers should be obviously checked and verified, you know, physically to make sure there's not any kind of off smells because sometimes these containers are coming they're coming from the port, right? So they could have had been transporting different products. I'm sure Ricardo maybe has more <laughs> experience in this than me, but um, yeah, we just, we wanna do a physical verification. Also, uh, there's usually a fumigation that, that occurs for the containers. Um, and then obviously we wanna line it to make sure that there's not um, anything that could get, you know, you know, get through to the coffee. Another issue that's probably, I've seen more is that sometimes there's like you know different bugs that are inside like of of the coffee that are inside of the um of the bags actually and they're kind of living with the coffee beans so i've seen this issue you know as an importer there's a couple of bags here and there that had this issue and this is more of a origin storage uh situation so not so much that they're, you know, the bugs are infiltrating, but maybe at the farm, they were, they were kept in kind of a weird spot and that's where these issues can occur. Okay, perfect, Good question. perfect. Uh, there's another one on uh, soil quality. Can you talk about soil quality and uh, how is organic coffee processed differently? Do you guys have any organics? Um, we don't um, have, any um let's see how can, can you talk about soil quality um yeah we we personally we don't produce any organic um coffee um this is a very per, you know personal decision depending on on the coffee producers and and their kind of methodology uh, approaching uh, coffee farmers uh, approaching coffee uh, production um you know, there's different, um, you know, theories and, and things as well as obviously organic. We don't produce uh, any organic coffee, so I might not be the best to, to speak on this, but um, pretty much the, the issue is we don't want to um, saturate the soil with too many chemical uh, products, fertilizers, because so we could damage kind of the, the, the natural um, environment of of where the coffee is, is produced. Uh, we mitigate that in very different ways. We have, we try to keep a lot of organic material around the coffee. We actually try to keep like weeds and stuff, which is not very uh, normal. A lot of coffee farmers will, you know, cut down the, the weeds, but my, my dad, uh, Raul, who is the primary coffee farmer, um, he uh, has this methodology of kind of keeping like a moist, you know, a good, good amount of moisture, keeping a lot of organic 
products around in the, we call them the callas, which is the spaces in between the, the coffee trees. Um, but there's really good organic producers here in Guatemala. Organic coffee pretty much processed differently. I don't know which process or which part of processing you're referring to, but as far as the production, it obviously doesn't utilize any, um, any, uh, anything that's not organic. So it has to use organic fertilizers, coffee pulp, uh, compost. Um, and then obviously it has to be kept separately at the warehouses, at the, um, the exporters have to have a separate area for the organic coffee. So it has to be clearly documented along the entire uh, supply chain, um, obviously for the certifications. So I hope that helped a little bit. Absolutely. And we have uh, time for one more question. And it's a follow up question uh, regarding Atlas Coffee. Is it, are they actually using um, an importer or are they going, I mean, are they going through a middleman or are, are they the direct importer like Starbucks and McDonald's? Okay, that's a great question. Um, we utilize a, um, an importer um, called Anthem Coffee Importers in Kansas City. So we have a, a really um, strong partnership with them and Atlas. So this is something that I talk about sometimes in presentations of like direct trade and things like that, that not necessarily the roaster has to pay the exporter or the farmer directly. Sometimes it, um, it's important that we have these partnerships along the supply chain. So your importers uh, are uh, are your best friend. They're, they're looking out for your, you, their, your needs. Uh, they will cup the quality. Um, you know, maybe not all exporters or farmers have the experience exporting. So they're kind of, uh, they're there to, to help you out and kind of um, in your negotiations. So that's something that I encourage is that we need to have transparent relationships along the supply chain. Um, and that way everybody uh, is happy with the result. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have uh, for today. Uh, excellent presentation and excellent questions. Thank you so much, Alejandro. It's very, very, very interesting. Uh, our next webinar will be Thursday, March 18. Uh, and it is the Container to the Port. Uh, John Heimseth uh, will share the process of importing coffee to the United States. Uh, John is the president of ACM Logistics and Consulting, and he has more than 20 years experience in the supply chain and international logistics. Uh, I want to thank everyone. We appreciate uh, your time today. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we have been recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our website. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. Good to see you. Uh, thanks everyone thank you. for participating. And this is the conclusion of our webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us.